Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, join me as I take a closer look at a few different species of hydrangeas. David Hillock introduces the 2021 Oklahoma Proven Shrub. Laura Payne shares a hot garden tool. Then we head to Oklahoma City to learn about another side of horticulture as we visit with the great folks at Calvert's Interiors. Finally, Barbara Brown is back with another tasty dish. We've got a full show, so let's get started. Hydrangeas have been around in the garden for a long time, and while there are some that can be a little bit more finicky to grow, there are definitely some that are well suited for the traditional Oklahoma garden. Today we're going to take a look at a few of the different species of hydrangeas. To start us off, we're going to talk about Hydrangea macrophylla, also known as the big leaf hydrangea, is probably the one that is most well known and often desired. Many of them have the recognizable mop head flower that can range from pink to blue and is influenced by the pH of the soil. If you purchase a blue hydrangea macrophylla and plant it in the ground, it may still bloom pink. So don't think you accidentally picked up the wrong plant. Most often in Oklahoma soils, you'll find that the lilac to pink range is a result of our slightly acidic to alkaline soil. To get that blue hydrangea, you need to have a highly acidic soil. So you might consider planting them alongside your azaleas or blueberries where perhaps the soil has been amended. Also, you can try growing them in a container where it will be easier to adjust the pH. Adding aluminum sulfate will make the flowers bluer while adding lime will make them pinker. And the soil needs to be amended well in advance of the flowering period, typically in late fall or early spring. Now the white macrophyllas will always be white regardless of the soil pH. And speaking of soil, most hydrangeas, especially the macrophylla, like a moist yet well-drained shady location. So you can see we've planted ours on the north side of one of our buildings. And while we have some trees planted there that will eventually provide some shade, they're not quite giving them just enough relief just yet. So you can see we've got a little bit of scorching on some of our macrophyllas. But finding that north side or that microclimate is a good idea for those macrophyllas in order to give them an ideal condition. Now when it comes to pruning hydrangeas, sometimes that can be a question mark depending on those species. For macrophyllas, traditionally macrophyllas bloom on what is known as old wood or last year's growth. So if you lose that vegetation during the winter or you prune it back too late in the season, you're actually removing your flowers, which means you won't have them the following season. However, because of the new breeding that's been going on with a lot of the hydrangeas, there are now known as repeat blooming macrophyllas that bloom on old wood and new wood. So even if you lose last year's growth, you still will have some flowers that come and are produced on that new season. A couple of those reblooming cultivars to be looking out for are called Fusion Glow and Nantucket Blue. Now the next hydrangea we're gonna look at is Hydrangea serrata. And it is very similar to Macrophylla. In fact, so similar that it used to actually be classified as a variety of Macrophylla. However, now given its own species, um, you can see that there are some similarities, but the biggest one is that it is actually smaller in stature than the Macrophyllas. It also tends to be a little bit more cold hardy because it's native to the mountains of Japan. Now, like Macrophylla, there are new re-blooming cultivars out on the market that will bloom on both old wood and new wood. So this particular species and cultivar Tough Stuff actually looks great and is still blooming even when we had negative 10 degree temperatures this last winter. 
Now the big difference between the serrata and the macrophylla is also the flower. So typically with the macrophylla we look for those large mop heads. Um, and so you can see here one has kind of got a little transition between that blue and the pink color. Now with serrata, more of them are going to be this lace cap. You can get macrophyllas that are in lace cap as well. In fact, these are both macrophyllas. However, I just wanted to demonstrate and show you the difference between what is known as a mop head and a lace cap. So again, mop heads are these big floppy um, balls of clusters of flowers that are beautiful. Whereas the lace cap offer you a little bit more of a delicate look in your garden. They have these sterile flower florets that bloom around the edges um, that kind of encircle these fertile flowers. So these aren't going to be as showy, but they kind of give it that delicate lacy look. Also, you'll notice that this is a flat umbel shape as well. So this is the traditional flower that you'll find on serrata, whereas this is more the traditional flower that you'll find on macrophylla. Now, speaking of flowers, the next hydrangea, Hydrangea paniculata, offers a completely different flowering structure. As the species implies, it has a conical pointed panicle of flowers. It is popular and one of the most easiest hydrangeas to grow because it is more cold hardy all the way up to zone three and blooms on new wood. So you don't have to worry about it dying back and you can go in in late winter and cut out any of that old uh, stems and still get new flowers the following season. Also, it's tolerant of air pollution, so it does well in urban locations. Now, this particular cultivar called Quick Fire, what's really neat about it is it opens up pure white, but as those flowers age, you'll notice that they start to turn a little bit pink. So you'll get this blushing pink that finally ends up being more of a burgundy color later in the season. Now, all of those hydrangeas that we've mentioned previously are native to Japan and the Asian continent. However, if you're looking for something a little bit more native, we do have a couple of species that are native to the U.S. One behind me, in fact, is hydrangea arborescence. It's native all the way up from New York down to Florida and into eastern Oklahoma. So it's hardy from zones three all the way to zones nine. It is, um, and it prefers, like some of the other hydrangeas, a moist, well-drained, shady condition. However, it's a little bit more tolerant of some of those rougher soil conditions, as well as it can handle a little bit more sun if irrigated properly. Now, hydrangea arborescence is native, However, this particular cultivar behind me is called Annabelle. Annabelle actually was discovered near Anna, Illinois. And while it's a naturally found uh, variety, you can see what really makes it stand out is the flower that gets over 12 inches across. Now there are a couple of cultivars that have been uh, bred from Annabelle, such as Incredible and Invincible, that have a little bit sturdier stems to hold those flowers up. The last hydrangea that I want to take a look at today is Hydrangea corsifolia. And corsifolia, the species name is Greek for oak-like leaf. And you can see definitely how this leaf compares to some of the other hydrangeas. It definitely has an oak-shaped leaf. Now, in addition to that unique texture, you can't forget about these amazing flowers that you get that are sort of that panicle yet mop head look to them. So this particular uh, oak leaf hydrangea, traditionally they'll get to be about eight feet tall. Now one thing to keep in mind is they do bloom on the old wood. So you're gonna wanna prune these back as soon as they're done blooming. Also, you might lose a little bit of that flower depending on the winter season and how low your temperatures get. Now, while this traditional species can get up to eight feet tall, there are some cultivars on the market that are gonna stay a little bit smaller, such as ruby slippers that only gets to be three to four feet tall. Now this was just a brief introduction into hydrangeas and some of the species that you might find on the market. To recap, all of the hydrangeas that we've mentioned do like a moist yet well-drained soil and especially prefer a little bit of shade from our Oklahoma summers. Now, if you're after that traditional blue colored hydrangea, make sure to look for hydrangea macrophylla. But keep in mind, just because you buy it and it's blue doesn't mean it will stay blue in your soil. It depends on the pH. Now, if macrophylla is a little bit too finicky for you, keep in mind there is also hydrangea paniculata, hydrangea arborescence, and hydrangea corsifolia that make a great addition to any Oklahoma garden.
Our Oklahoma proven shrub for 2021 is Virginia Sweet Spire, or Itea virginica. This is a native shrub to eastern Oklahoma, but it's actually quite adaptable and will grow throughout most of the state. It does prefer acid soils, but it, again, it's, it's not too picky. It can get a little chlorotic in higher pH soils. But this plant is found growing in the wild in actually boggy, wet soils. It grows in as an understory plant in shady conditions, but it's also very full sun tolerant. This is a nice deciduous shrub that grows three to six feet high with arching branches. Flowers appear in late spring to early summer, and they are long spires of tiny white flowers. And the flowers open up from the base out to the tip, so it appears that they're blooming longer than, than they really are. This also has wonderful fall color. So in the fall time, the, the leaves will turn uh, burgundy red, uh, red and orange colors. The flowering and the, the fall color, even though this plant tolerates shady conditions, the flowering and the fall color is actually even better when it's grown out in full sun. Now there are several different cultivars that are available uh, within the species that are grown and sold in the garden centers. Uh, many of them are smaller than the species, so they're dwarf forms. Uh, they grow anywhere from two to three feet to maybe three to four feet high and just as wide. Um, Henry's uh, Garnet is probably one of the most popular varieties. Uh, there's another one called Scentlandia, which has larger flowers and is supposed to have um, also very more, a, a great deal of fragrance too. So these flowers are quite fragrant, but the Scentlandia is, is considered to be more fragrant than the others. everyone. I'd like to share a few more cool tools with you that I have found on the market. And lately I have been experiencing some pain with arthritis in my thumb. So these old-fashioned spray nozzles just aren't cutting it for me anymore. But I have discovered this new cool battery operated spray nozzle. So some containers I have noticed on the market now already come prepackaged with this spray nozzle. However, I have found this, which is just a generic universal spray nozzle, battery operated, that will go on any of your other refillable containers. So this little tool here has been a lifesaver for me in the garden. Now always remember, whenever you're spraying any kind of pesticide, to read the label, the label is the law, and wear proper PPE. If you're not into spraying weeds, then you can also use this other cool tool that I have found, and it is a propane torch. So you just connect a disposable canister of propane to it, push this little button down here, which ignites the fuel, and you can then burn off the weeds that are in your landscape, uh, on your sidewalk, driveway, just please don't catch your yard or your neighbor's yard on fire. My name is Victor Getz. I'm the president of Calvert's Plant Interiors and Comias in Tulsa. What we do is, sounds like an oxymoron, but they call it interior scape. So we actually design and install interior landscapes, and we do this all over the state. 
We uh, have a crew of people that are trained horticulturists that come out and take care of those plants. So anybody's welcome to come in here anytime they want. It's a very old nursery. It's been a nursery since 1907. It was founded by the Ray family and Calvert's has been in business since 1978. Comey is in Tulsa has been in business since 1972. My business partner, Bob Calvert, found this property in 1980, and I came on board about eight years later. It's a little jewel in the middle of Oklahoma City. I don't think people think that they can come in here because we don't have a big parking lot in front, but if you're ever driving down North Class and Boulevard, you're welcome to come in and check us out. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful place, and uh, we've got the best crew in town. So often when we talk about horticulture, we think about the outside landscape, but part of horticulture is also looking at the interior scape. Today joining us is Alex Payne, who works for Calvert's Plant Interior, and we're at one of your clients? Yes, we are, yes. So tell us that we're at Leadership Square in downtown Oklahoma City. Yes. So tell us a little bit about what your role is for interior scaping. So I'm a designer at Calvert's, um, and I'm basically a liaison between our clients and kind of what we do in terms of designing these spaces for them. This is one of my clients' uh, buildings, and so we've uh, designed, I've helped you know, work in designing all of these beds and various pots, and we do holiday decorations and all kinds of things for them. Yeah, know. so so often we appreciate that, but we don't realize that somebody has dedicated their life to doing yeah. this sort of thing. So yeah. in hotels, resorts, mm -hmm. um, office buildings, yeah. and I assume each, each setting is as unique as an outdoor garden, right? Exactly. You have to worry about the light. You have to worry about the the airflow. You have to worry about um, the people. Know, the people. <laughs> how, yeah. How public is the space? You have to be careful of what kind of plants you put in. You know, you don't want to have a bunch of you know cactus here where you know somebody might hurt themselves. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be light is a huge factor for I was designing. Say, yeah, so we've got glass, um, mm -hmm. you know, walls over there, but yeah, yeah. we're kind of dark down here. Really dark over here. So these are all going to be very low light plants. Um, of course, if we've got plants up next to the glass, those are considered high light, um, depending on, you know, southeast, west. But when they're in the middle of a room like this, you have to be really careful not to put something that needs direct sunlight because you're never going to get it. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about like what, um, do these plants get replaced? Are they maintained regularly? Mm -hmm. Do they go away or These how plants these? in here for this specific building are maintained twice a week. So um, we've got a plant technician that comes in on Tuesdays and Thursdays, waters them, cleans them, makes sure they, you know, stay pest free, keeps trash and things out of them because it is a public space. Uh -huh. If any of them don't make it or start kind of, you know, struggling, need to be replaced, we come in and do that. Um, and it's as simple as just pulling them out and putting a new one in. We sort of have a mirage here that this is a planted bed, but in reality, the plants are happier. So staying yeah, so in they're their actually pots. in their pots. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Actually, in their pots. So most house plants like to kind of have that root bound, snug environment. Mm -hmm. They don't want to just have a free for all for watering and things. Plus, like that would that. also be a lot of soil to bring in. And tons I mean, of soil. A, yeah, a these are other... very deep beds. So okay. Okay. It's a whole other, so tell us know. a little bit about some of the other clients that you have and some of their requests or. Mm -hmm. What's so in terms of public spaces, like you said, we work in restaurants, we work in hotels, other office buildings. Um, most of those, you know, in terms of just kind of bringing green into those spaces, um, mm -hmm. kind of a, more putting things that are more aesthetically pleasing, you know, helping the air quality and that type of thing. Um, we do some residential work and some of those can be a little bit smaller and, you know, just a plant here or there. But okay. um, our biggest clients are probably going to be in this downtown area and it's going to be more commercial public spaces. So you mentioned the air quality. What are some of the other benefits? Why are people wanting to bring plants inside? People want to work in a green space. They help, you know, it helps filter the air. It, you know, it's pleasing to the eye. People, people enjoy having plants 
in their environment. And so. it, doesn't it also help soften the sound too? We've Definitely. Got Great for sound dampening. Um, of course, in a space like this where you've got a water feature, you've got restaurants, it can be very loud. Without these plants, it would be even louder than what it is now. That's so, fabulous. So yeah. is there ever a situation where you're like, oh, we just don't have an, a right plant for that situation? And what do you do in those situations? So if there is an area that we don't necessarily have uh, the light or, you know, even somebody who doesn't want to, you know, pay for our maintenance program or mm -hmm. doesn't have a green thumb, um, we have some silk options that you can also use for those areas. Um, but they do require some maintenance too, A little right? bit of maintenance, yeah. You just got to, you know, come through and uh, usually it's really just as simple as dusting. Okay. But you have to do that a little bit more frequently on the faux than you do on the live. Okay. So, okay. yeah. And then, and uh, you also mentioned that you had some moss options. Can you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about what those yes, are? Yes, so what we do, and Leadership has a couple of these um, moss walls, moss um, sort of like picture frames, so we'll frame up moss. We have several different types of moss, all in various colors, um, different textures, and so we kind of work with, uh, with one of our greenhouse gals, and they kind of help us put together those different moss walls and frames. So and are those living moss or All preserved. Okay. Yep, all preserved moss. Um, pretty little maintenance when you have them in a public space like this. People get handsy so you know you may have to come in a couple times a year and kind of replenish the spots that have been touched but other than that no water, no anything so they're really good for a space that doesn't get any light or you know okay. even a space that's tight. But yet yeah, still offer some of those things that green plants do, Absolutely. softening. Yeah. Softening, sound dampening, yeah. all, all of the aesthetics. So. Excellent. Well, thank you, Alex, so yeah. much for sharing this thank with us. Thank you. We're glad you could come we, by. We appreciate your work that you're doing. Thank you. Today we're doing peas and pancetta. Now, pancetta is obviously something that is Italian, and so you may not be able to find it in your local market. You could substitute something like uh, bacon. It's not going to be the same, but when we adapt things for where we are, we make a few changes. So we're going to Oklahomaize it, uh, and if you need to, you can do that. Now, what I'm going to use are frozen peas. This would normally be made with fresh peas, but in my life, fresh peas are hard to come by. They take a lot of time and peas freeze extremely well. So I'm going to use frozen peas in this recipe, uh, but I want to cook them about halfway. Follow the directions on the package. I'm going to put them in the microwave, uh, let them cook about uh, half of the time that it calls for because they're going to continue to cook in, in another, uh, another form as well. So I'm going to put these in for about five minutes. I'm going to cover them and uh, then we'll move on from there. I've got three tablespoons of unsalted butter. Now, this is a recipe that is normally uh, originated in Italy, and so they use more fat in some of their cooking than we do in ours. So three tablespoons of butter sounds like a lot for a U.S. dish, and we're actually going to add to it a little bit. Uh, what we find in, in some of those places, though, is while they use a lot of fat in the foods they cook, they don't eat a lot of convenience products uh, or snack foods that have uh, a lot of fat added to them. So um, they actually end up uh, getting less in their diet in some cases than, than we do, even though we use less at meals. So I've added uh, about three and a half ounces, anywhere between two to three and a half ounces of uh, pancetta uh, to the pan. And we're going to cook them over really low heat. Let's see if I can turn it down anymore without this starting to click too much on me. Uh, you don't want the butter to uh, over brown uh, because that'll be burned and give you an off flavor. Uh, but you want it to cook really slowly and you're going to cook it just until the pancetta starts to get golden. It'll probably take about five minutes, maybe even a little bit longer than the peas are taking. Uh, so uh, just be real patient with it. Do it as slowly as you can. And you notice that we didn't have very many ingredients in here because all of these ingredients on their own are providing a lot of flavor. The peas have been cooked down. They're about halfway cooked. And so I'm just going to drain them and add them to our pan with our beautiful looking pancetta. 
Stir these together, let everything get warmed up, let the flavors blend. So two to three minutes and this is gonna be ready for your plate. This one is great. Now it's not bacon, so you didn't want to get it all crispy like bacon will do. Uh, I did cut it in small strips so that it would cook and be able for everyone to get bites. Again, this is my kind of serving when it comes to vegetables. Officially, this would serve six. And again, that would be my serving if I was at the table because I absolutely love it. This is peas and pancetta. I hope you'll give it a try. It's wonderful. For Oklahoma Gardening, this is Barbara Brown. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Each week we feature various aspects of the Botanic Garden here at OSU. You won't want to miss next week as we give you a full virtual tour of the many different gardens it has to offer. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussion on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>